Well, good evening again, and welcome to the Schmidt Theater. My name is Ryan White. I'm director of the Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization here at the California Academy of Sciences, and it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's insightful conversation. Tonight's conversation is Journey Through Our DNA, featuring Ann Wyshynski, and she's in conversation with Dr. Moira Gunn of Tech Nation. Ann Wyshynski is the co-founder and CEO of 23andMe, a, a Silicon Valley startup that takes its name from the number of chromosomes inside all of our cells. Uh, she started out uh, in investments with a primary focus in biotech industries, and she started 23andMe uh, as a way to have a positive impact on research and medicine. And as I said, she's in conversation with uh, Dr. Moira Gunn, who's the host of NPR's Tech Nation and Biotech Nation, uh, which has a, total, uh, in a, has a total reach of about 177 countries worldwide. Uh, biotech, is actually the only biotech Nation is actually the only national weekly radio program devoted to biotech. So before we enter our conversation, I would like to just make uh, a few general announcements. First of all, we'd like to extend our thanks to uh, the Templeton Franklin Fund, in, uh, uh, Franklin Templeton Investments, for sponsoring tonight's uh, cocktail reception, and also to Wells Fargo for sponsoring the insightful conversations. So, just so you know, this conversation will last just about 35 minutes, and at the end of the conversation, we are going to ask that you exit at the front of the theater, uh, toward the right-hand side. That will take you right out toward dinner. Uh, if you would like, you can also exit the top of the theater and take a more roundabout route uh, toward, uh, toward dinner. And if you have any difficulties uh, exiting the theater, please just stay in your seats and we'll have someone come and assist you. We'll also have plenty of people to assist with uh, beverage cups uh, to expedite uh, everyone getting out of the theater and staying on time. And finally, uh, let me just take a moment to thank all of you. Uh, thanks to you, the Academy is able to extend its mission to explore, explain, and sustain the natural world. So thank you very much for all of your support. And finally, let me just turn things over to Great. our two discussants this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I want to welcome you all here tonight. What you really needed to be on was the conference call because no one had met each other before, and we just all chatted, chatted, chatted. It's like, well, this chat's going to go well. <laughs> so we knew that. And I do want to thank a lot of people that have come up and said, oh, I listened to Tech Nation. This is really great. And so as a reward, you won't hear it through the dashboard of your car or like some serious, you know, on your iPod, all the various places. You get to hear it right in person. From San Francisco, I'm Moira Gunn, and this is Tech Nation. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And uh, so this is really, this is really great. And one of the things I wanted to start out with is uh, just really quickly to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, there's no, you can't define a company just by in just a few sentences. But to get everybody, you're the founder and co-founder and CEO of 23andMe. Uh, let's do not a long description, but really from a consumer point of view, what does the consumer give? What does the consumer pay? What does the consumer get? Is that part of the 23andMe proposition? Sure. So, um, so 23andMe is very simple. It's a, um, it's a spit test. Um, you go online. You go to 23andMe.com. You order a little box. You get a tube in the mail. You spit in the tube. It takes about five minutes. Um, you send that back through the mail, and um, that goes to our lab in, in Los Angeles. We extract the DNA. We then run it through our software, and we send you an email that says, welcome to you. And we have a website, the majority of the company is dedicated to actually helping individuals understand what their DNA means for them. And that could be on the health side or that could be on the ancestry side um, and all kinds of fun things in between. And so I think this is a, a really important thing. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people and they get really confused about all what that is. And I think what's important now is to start, because we're saying, where do we start with this? And I think uh, it's really important to understand if we all look back on our lives, and we can look back, you know, sort of each decade as we go, boy, a lot of things changed. Science changed, 
technology changed, information changed, communications changed. And you have a, a, a bachelor's in biology from Yale. You got it in 19, we we're gonna, you know, discuss this. <laughs> this is a courtesy <laughs> interview, guys. For some it's old and for some it's young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they had, you know, that, that monk with the peas and everything. He was long dead. Um, that, that's <laughs> the time frame we're gonna yeah. give this here. And, uh, uh, but let's talk about the sort of the state of the, you know, the edge of the, edge of the, of the, of the of what we say the the best knowledge in biology then where biology came from mm -hmm. in you know in before the last millennium and where it is now that biology yeah. itself has changed you couldn't do 23 and me and yeah back then so when I um, when I graduated college or when I graduated high school I actually spent some time at UCSD and I took uh, I took this class and it was about sort of big picture trends that were coming and it was actually interesting it was two topics so one was the human genome project that it was just starting and the other was HIV and I remember the teacher talking about how um, HIV would never be cured because the virus mutated so quickly and it was gonna be impossible to ever really understand it or ever control it. And then the Human Genome Project and about how this was gonna be decades and decades and that this would transform our life. And um, what's interesting is both of those two elements really had a massive impact on me. And one, it's that HIV is actually treatable today and people can actually have a long lifespan with it, and it's because of genetics. It's really because that they started to understand the genetics of it, that we are able to develop therapies for it, and when someone today is diagnosed with HIV, they are first sequenced, they understand what mutations they have, and they're able to actually make a therapy for them that doesn't have any, that's not gonna have any kind of resistance. Um, the second element that was really transformational for me is understanding about this human genome project and how it was starting and how it was gonna be this huge project and it was gonna be you know, decades long. And, and the fact that after understanding this $3 billion monstrosity project, you can today for $99 get you know, a simplified version of your genome and you can start to understand it is, is amazing. So after learning about this and the project that was going on, it really incited in me that I one day wanted to be able to have access to this and that the next, my life would be about trying to understand what the genome meant. And that's a big part of for 23andMe is that we really understand just a tiny fraction of what it means, of what, the D of what your DNA means. And a big component of 23andMe is really crowdsourcing those solutions. And so if I look around the room, we're all different. And, and what's interesting is, you know, we all hear about diseases like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. And what's really interesting is, you know, something like Huntington's disease, you know, it's seen as, you know, you, you have this, you, this genetic variant and you have the disease, but there's people who are in their 80s and 90s who actually have Huntington's disease, but they're asymptomatic. So, so is there something in their genome that is making them not have the disease? And so that means that every single one of you is actually special, not necessarily just because you're special and you are all special, we but you're special that. in a way that actually might help someone else and that might actually help cure a disease. And that was a lot of the origin of 23andMe is that we'll be able to really crowdsource solutions and we'll be able to have a revolution in our, in our healthcare by actually having tons and tons of data and by actually understanding the genome. I think what's also interesting for me to learn is not just facts and things, but I learn a lot. I'm afraid I, I you know, you read about 100 books a year, you get a, I can never get invited to cocktail parties. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> she'll start talking, don't do that. And, uh, but I think what was so funny is that we, people really want to hear, you know, every week they want to hear about the biotech, which we do as well, as the, and the tech, and we're not just like the latest trends, but it's like, what does this mean, and where are we, where's the arc of the technology going, and where have we been? And we did an interview this week, and the and it was um, really specifically uh, uh, Savate Pabo. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's the guy that extracted the DNA from Neanderthal bones, mm -hmm. and they had a hard time with that, but everybody handling him. He had to go back to the first one they found back in the 1800s because somehow they didn't they didn't pick it up with human hands and actually mm -hmm. taint it. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, and then it turned out that the Neanderthals with the mitochondrial DNA from the mother, it turns out if you're Northern European, you know, Homo sa sapiens, you know, those guys really like those Neander Neanderthal <laughs> gals. <laughs> and what we know from the DNA is that they couldn't have the muscles to have the Neanderthals, couldn't have the complexity, the intonality, and many different sounds that we did. So perfect, she can't talk. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> 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 Where am I? Am I getting anything wrong here? And so, but I mean, it was it was it was really interesting. I mean, he just went on. He, there was a lot more to this interview, but it was really fascinating. Here's what I didn't get. This week it went up, and on Tuesday, you know, we posted the vi uh, the audio and stuff. 
it blew the doors off our bandwidth on our supposedly infinite bandwidth uh, downloading system. And I was like, why this? And I'm getting these emails. I have to send this to my extended family. They're not getting that. I was like, how could, uh, this was the last interview I thought would be interesting. Mm -hmm. But I think people really are interested yeah. in who they are. Yeah. And so when you say, can we get together? They want to get together. Yeah. Together, just who we are can solve a lot of problems for humanity. Yeah. So one of the things actually when we started the company, um, I was at a conference called TED, and, um, and I was sitting with Craig Venter, who's one of the pioneers in the genetics field, and we were Who also really sped up the human genome He project. also, he was very in involved in this. And so we're sitting at the, at the, at the dinner table, there's about 20 people, and he starts talking about one of his latest discoveries or what's coming, and you know, people are like, yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting. And then I mentioned, I said, well, how many people here at the table smell the asparagus in their pee? And um, and about 80% <laughs> of people laugh. Neither one and of us are going to get invited <laughs> yeah. anywhere. <laughs> well, for the 20% of people who stare at you and they're like, what are you talking about? And um, <laughs> and then they start asking these questions like, well, do I do I have to like really get down and smell it? And you're like, no, no, you really don't. And so an hour later, people were still talking about the asparagus and the pea and talking, and I use that as an example of, genet of human genetic variability about how so there's a genetic variant associated with it, how some people can smell it, some people can't, and it's kind of what makes us all different. And the fact that an hour later people were still commenting on it and it becomes sort of a, a cocktail party trick and Craig Venter's discovery kind of like it was a, a 30 second discussion sort of made like you need to make genetics accessible and it was something that people could relate to. So one of the things 23 Me's always done is tried to take sort of the basic fun human elements like the asparagus question or cilantro which is remarkably controversial on our website. Um, you know, and we talk about like why is it that some people love it and some people hate it. I finally got while your logo is the crossed asparagus. <laughs> that one that is red. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'll do. I'll make one smelly. And one <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Now, I think one of the things I, I like people to understand is where 23andMe is in the whole landscape of the global biotechnology industry. We've got biopharma. Uh, I defy you to uh, eat any food tonight that hasn't been genetically modified. You know, uh, you've, you've already probably had some. Um, we've got uh, fuel, we've got energy, we've got industry, we've got diagnostics, we've got all kinds of things. Where are, where would you put 23andMe mm -hmm. in the in that whole landscape, global industry wise? So, so I first I want to ask this audience: How many people have ever had a genetic test? How many people have had a genetic test associated with a therapy that they've been on? So my goal is in the next 10 years that every single one of you would raise your hand. Because I think if you think about how we're actually going to match up with the biotech and the whole biopharmaceutical industry, is that we actually need to understand why some therapies work for some individuals and it doesn't work for others. Or why some people get an adverse event and some people don't. So again, you can think about the basic examples, things like Benadryl. So some percentage of you get hyper when you take it, you raise your hands, and some percentage of you get sleepy. And so those are the types of things like you'd want to know if you're giving Benadryl to your child on an overnight flight on the airplane, you want to know <laughs> which one it's going to be. And so it's an example, again, that you can all relate to, but if you had a serious disease, you would want to know are you going to respond or are you not going to respond? Or are you going to have a severe adverse event or are you not going to have that? And I think that's where genetics is going to lay the foundation to partner with the entire drug development industry. And not just drug development, but the devices. You know, there's other things, like a lot of people get met def defibrillators put into their heart to prevent having sort of sudden cardiac death. But, but only 1% of them ever go off. So things like that, you should start to understand who actually needs an invasive procedure, who doesn't, who actually needs a therapy, and who doesn't. And the basis for all of this is going to be your genome. Well, think about warfarin when you go into an emergency room. There's a percentage of us that shouldn't go near that, and yet it right. saves a lot of people's lives. So the idea is that at some point, if you have a test, you expect it to be a genetic test. Right. So, for instance, the state of Hawaii just sued a manufacturer saying um, they have a, there's a drug called Plavix, and it's known that a certain percentage of the population does not respond to Plavix, but it's a very commonly prescribed medication. So the state of Hawaii actually just sued, saying, like, you should not have been selling the medication to, our, to the state 
because like the majority of people are not responding to it. So I think more and more we're starting to see that momentum coming, but I think more and more people are gonna start to demand they wanna know if the therapy is going to work for them before they're gonna take it. So that term blockbuster drug, a lot of that had to do with, we'll take it, I'll oh, take an antidepressant, six weeks later they go, well how you feeling? Feeling any better? You know, this is not, not acceptable. Um, it's like we wanna know that the population that's taking it, it's really effective, uh, uh, and then move on to something else. Right. So every, a lot of things that are, we think new drugs, but putting things on the shelf. And what I like about what you're saying is that, is that all of this activity can go out in the entire biotech industry, but your body of information there at 23andMe is growing and actually continues to serve throughout. It's, it, it, its pastiche, if you will, continues to change over time. Right. So one of the things that I, that I again, also found really instrumental to, to starting this is there's a story that came out, it was a New York Times article a while ago about the girl um, at who was identified as being pregnant by Target before she knew she was pregnant and before her father did, and Target started sending her coupons for her pregnancy. And in part it was because Target had so much information about her and the entire community that they could start, that they knew that she was likely to be pregnant. And I, and I look at that for healthcare, like that's fine. Like we do that all the time in marketing. Like you, you know, like any store you walk they, into. They started sending me vodka. Right. <laughs> 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 well, we can work on that. <laughs> um, but it would be great if I walked into my physician's office and the physician said, oh Ann, you know, you're a couple years away from being diabetic and having heart disease. Like based on these things, you need to change this aspects of your behavior. And I think that's where big data should really be able to help us prevent disease, not just treating it, but to actually be able to prevent it. And there's certain things that you look at, things like Alzheimer's. So none of us want to have Alzheimer's, and there's genetic markers associated with the disease, but it will be helpful for us to understand, you know, what are, the, what are the environmental factors that make it so some people get the disease and some people don't. And maybe you start screening way before you're ever symptomatic, because it's quite likely that the disease actually starts way before you actually get those symptoms. So you don't want to wait for those symptoms, you want to know ahead of time. But you're not going to know that you're at risk for the disease unless you actually know what your genetic basis is. And we see that all the time in cancer. We know mutations, genetic mutations cause cancer. That, that jury is way in. That's like, come on, this is, we know that. And those genetic mutations happen quite early. And it's like, we can detect those because we knew who you were and we know portions of you where it's become. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of things mean we don't have to talk about a cure for something we've prevented. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so. I think there's some major things here. But of course, we've been talking, we've been kind of dabbling over into this thing of uh, pharmaceuticals and diagnostics and that kind of And peop anybody who's been following some of this in the news, well, the FDA came out and they had sort of a, a little dance with, with 23andMe. Mm -hmm. And people have to understand that the FDA is not ruling 23andMe. Let's talk about that relationship. What part is there a relationship between? FDA, and what part has it nothing to do with, and, and where does that all fit right now? Sure, so, so the FDA, on November 22nd, the FDA sent us a letter asking us to stop selling, uh, stop returning the health component of our, of our product. So if you buy the product today, you get the raw data, and you get the ancestry, but you do not get the health component. And, um, and so the FDA, we've been working with the FDA for a while, and, and the, the big change that came about, and this started as discussions back when the company was started, is that most diagnostic tests are one disease, one test. So you walk in and you say, I wanna get a cystic fibrosis test. It's a cystic fibrosis test, and, and that's it. And it's, it's not engaging, it's not something that you go back to on and on. And 23andMe was intentionally set up. It's, it's a million data points in your DNA, and anytime there was a new article that comes out that's relevant to or interesting, it's you know on the front page of the New York Times, we would write an article about it and we, we want to educate customers about it. And that's a million points out of three billion. Okay. So just a just a tiny points. fraction of, of your yeah. DNA. But the whole goal here was to really keep people actually engaged with it. And that if I can if if an interesting paper comes out, I don't want to just leave it in the realm of sort of the obscure scientific world of the white coats that can uh, the rest of us can't understand it, but to actually really make it accessible. And so 23andMe is an unusual diagnostic test in the capacity that it was changing all the time, and we're updating people all the time. And so the regulatory system does not really structured 
to fit in, or we're not really you know, made to fit into this sort of more rigid regulatory structure. So we're working with the FDA. It's important for them to understand things like analytical validity. If I tell you a certain point is an A, that it really is an A. And then there's also some of the points about, you know, can you handle some of the data, things like breast cancer results? Can you handle some of that? So we're continuing to work with the FDA, but that this is a regulatory challenge. Um, and it's also really unusual that we are direct to consumer. So for instance, if you want to go and get your vitamin D levels tested, you have to go to a physician. Like, does that really, is that really the most efficient way to run the system? So I would argue, no. Like, why do I need to go to the physician to actually get my lab tests? Why do I need to get it written? I might want to have a discussion with them, but like, I might want to do that online, or I might want to do it in lots of other ways. It doesn't have to be, you know, it just seems like an unnecessary uh, inconvenience. Th in this, this, has been, this has been a concern when, when they first were talking about home pregnancy tests. They were right. not sure that a woman could be alone and get the news. Right. <laughs> well, she could wait nine months. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, then she'd get the news. <laughs> and you know what? I've been really bad. Now, I know when you came in with your drink, they gave you a really nice cup, and they didn't decide to take that opportunity to hand you a nice card and a pen as a souvenir. <laughs> you actually get to ask questions. <laughs> but I've been a hog. So if you've written any questions, just write them down and send them over here, and we promise to take it. Uh, a few as, as, as we can do that, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, please do it as well. Um, now, uh, let's talk about wh what's going on now. Mm -hmm. Clearly, technology, better, faster, cheaper. When it t did the original G Human Genome Project, you know, we took years, we took scientists all over the world, we took millions of dollars, a whole genome, not three billion we're talking about, so we have your whole program. And then, of course, we might throw in some epigenetics, you know, right. all around it, because we found out we actually carry some other stuff. And um, how much do you think that is today for a whole genome? And how much will it be five, ten years from now? Uh, so, um, oh, this so is such a trick question. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, we know these questions. We price it all the time. Because <laughs> yeah. we would love to offer a, a whole genome at some point. So we yeah. know it's, we, um, so, I mean, there's the big announcement that there's a $1,000 genome, and I think that that's, that's, theoretical a little bit still. Um, and you know, people should be able to buy their genomes for three to five thousand dollars. So I think it's it's definitely coming down in price. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that Beijing Genome Institute in China is the largest um, they bought all the equipment out. <laughs> right. So they're the largest sequencing house out there. They bought a company out here called Complete Genomics and they are aggressively getting a lot of genetic data out there. So um, you know, I think that there's going to be more competition and genetic pricing is going to fall in the, a lot in the next five to ten years. So And remembering this is a business, so we're talking about, gee, maybe we uh, decode your uh, genome for free and we sell you these other services. Or mm -hmm. maybe, I mean, there's a lot of room in here for where should we go and how should we do it. And that, again, is we actually don't really know what that means. You mm -hmm. know, where well, we, we don't know. I mean, that's one of the things between what 23andMe does and the, and the whole genome is that we're trying to sort of consolidate it down to a lot of the information that we know something about so that it's a shortened version of your genome, but we can tell you a lot more about it. So the challenge here is like we still, like we have, you know, we have all this code and we really don't understand what it means. And we're not going to really understand it until we get massive amounts of data and tons and tons of your, like your medical records, information about you. And that's actually the most exciting part is that if you could start to combine, like really crowdsource, and you know, people probably are wearing their Nike fuel bands and other things, like getting your medical record data and all your environmental data, combining that with your genetic information, and you'll really start to understand what keeps people healthy, and then how do you actually optimally treat yourself if you're sick? And what do you do with all the uh, leftover spit? We keep it. Those are really awesome. Ew! <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I mean, we keep it because people <laughs> frequently want to, um, they, like, you might want to get another test in two years. So we biobank it. Uh -huh. So you have the ability to opt out of it, but most You can get a whole genome. You could be a breakthrough in technology. There always are these kinds of things. But it's like, okay, we got it, and that's there. So you keep it on We keep storage. it, because, yeah, it's a, people do want to get their whole genomes, and they have wanted additional testing, so it's easy to keep it. Now, do we have any of those cards? Are they coming in? The cards and letters are coming in here, and uh, we probably have a lot of them. But uh, uh, we're looking, we're looking forward to this. The uh, oh, I don't get them. <laughs> 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 it's the elusive dream. First two. Oh, good. Am I? Did I tell you to write large? Okay. Um, uh, here's the, here's the masses. 
Is it the price point, which is now $100, mm -hmm. as opposed to $600 or $300, whatever, or not wanting to know mm -hmm. to keep the masses from 23 me? And I have to say, it was the first time I'd seen it. It doesn't mean that that was the only place, but it's like you're very clear when you do it. You say, you can't unknow this mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. So how much of that might keep people from doing it? So I think there's two main reasons, two main fears that people usually come up with. Is one is they, they're worried about what, what the information is going to be. And frankly, that's actually just a lot of education in my mind. So people have seen movies like Gattaca where they're really worried about genetic information, what's that going to mean for them. And I try to explain to them it's a lot like a cholesterol test. So if you get a cholesterol test and you find out you have high cholesterol, it doesn't mean you're going to die of a heart attack imminently. It just means that you have a risk factor for heart disease. And so the same way, you might be high risk for Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean that you are necessarily going to get Alzheimer's, but you have a risk factor for it. But there's other risk factors there. And that's part of the excitement for me that's always been between nature and nurture is that we're, we're, you're born with a certain deck of cards and, and you have the ability yeah. to alter your lifestyle. So if the more we could actually understand the lifestyle and what you could actually do with it, then you could optimize your deck of cards. So the nice thing is that balance. There's very few things that are deterministic, Huntington's being you know, pretty much one of them. So the more that you could actually optimize them, the better. The second thing that people were always worried about was the insurance question. And frankly, that was actually one of the main reasons why we went direct to consumer. And I think people don't necessarily always realize that when you go to the doctor and your insurance company pays for something, they own it. And that was one of my takeaways from Wall Street is how much you, the individual, actually have no choice. Because you constantly have a middleman. Like imagine if there was a middleman for every time you wanted to go out to dinner. I mean, it would just be a nightmare. So you have that middleman in your healthcare right now. And so the challenge is if the healthcare system paid for your genetic information, they would own it. So 23andMe was direct to consumer because we felt like this is sensitive enough information that you would want to keep it and you want to own it and control who's going to get access to it. Now, this is an interesting question in light of what you just said, and is how are doctors or the medical profession, now we're not talking insurance companies, we're not yeah. talking pharma, we're not talking all the other things, the hospitals, how are how do doctors receive 23andMe? I mean, are they willing to work with you? Uh, do they have? A pr they say, "Oh my gosh, I hate it when they go in the door and they have the printout with them." How? What kind of reception have you gotten? So I think with physicians, it's definitely up in the air and it's a little bit mixed. And one of the things that um, um, at a conference we went to, there was a physician, a physician who stood up and he said, "Look, the biggest problem with 23andMe is you generate non-billable questions." And um, and I think that that's, that's <laughs> that that's can be fixed. <laughs> that's actually sort of the harsh reality. And um, you know, even lately, we were talking with an insurance company, and I remember the company after an hour of discussion, and and the guy said, you know, listen, people, like we all know we're trying to figure out the solution, but we know what works here, and it's green. And if we can figure out how to fix the financial incentives here, then people will use this information. And I remember once again from Wall Street, there are these things called drug eluding stents and they had a phenomenal reimbursement code. So physicians who use drug eluting stents would get reimbursed much more money than the other technology. And there was something like 85% adoption in six weeks when these drug eluting stents came out. So it just shows like physicians can really adopt a new technology when there's a huge f financial incentive. So I think that 23andMe, the challenge here is that like physicians are not educated in genetics and there's not a financial incentive for it. And that you can't blame a physician because if I walk in and I say, hey, I'm high risk for Parkinson's disease and I want to spend an hour talking about it and they're not going to make any money on it, I can't blame them. No one wants to work for free. So, so that's part of where I think there has to be a political change where in part of what's great actually about the, about the Obamacare is that it actually is putting those incentives in place more and more where there is an incentive to actually keep you healthy. And it's part of the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm an advertisement for Kaiser. Like I, their incentives are aligned to actually keep me healthy there. Uh, now this is interesting. You sort of touched on it, but I think it, I think it bears going a little deeper. How reliable are your DNA test results? Let's talk about reliability because that's, that's an edge we're working on right now. So reliability is, is um, it's, it's sort of a two-folded question. People ask when they ask about reliability, there's two elements. So one is if I tell you that you, know, you have an A, C, G, and T in your genome, if I tell you that you're an A at this point, how, how real is it? Is it really an A? And that's where we have a 99.9% .9 reproducibility. So it's, if I tell you that you're an A there, it's very, very likely that that is in fact an A. So if I tell you then it on, it on the interpretation side, for instance, if I say that that A means that you're a carrier for cystic fibrosis, 
that's where it varies. So for cystic fibrosis, that's a very well-established association. We know that certain mutations mean that you are a carrier for cystic fibrosis or that you're high risk for breast cancer. The area that's more gray is as we start to understand sort of disease risk. So for instance, in prostate cancer, we know certain genes are associated with the increased risk of prostate cancer, but we certainly don't understand the entire genome. So it's tough for us to actually say uh, with an exact number exactly how, how, hot, how elevated is your, is your risk for something like prostate cancer. So that's where there's a lot of things that are actually changing there. So there's more variability on that element, but in terms of the accuracy of the test and the underlying, the data quality, if I tell you that you have a certain A, C, G, or T at a certain data point, that part is an incredibly reproducible technology. Now, it turns out we have a lawyer and a parent in the audience mm -hmm. with a related question. The lawyer wants to know if, uh, I'm assuming this is a lawyer here, I, that's un really <laughs> unfair of me, but um, wants to know if anybody, since you have my spit, can anybody subpoena my DNA? And, um, and the parent wants to know, my son who is 12 years old, sent in his spit, I worry about his privacy, should I? Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of the subpoenaing your DNA, I mean 23andMe, we have no, um, we have, um, what's it called, the um, chain of custody. So if you ordered three kits, um, I have no idea what you did with those kits. So I might have, you might have ordered three kits and then given to all your coworkers as presents. So there's no real chain of custody for actually knowing where the DNA went. So if you are asked on a form, did you spit, do you need to be honest about that? I mean, I would tell you to consult with your lawyers about whether or not you want to be honest or not. Um, I would assume that you want to be honest on that. But in terms of, for us, in terms of actually having that chain of custody, we don't actually have a legal chain of custody of actually knowing who, if you actually spat and if that's actually what, if that's actually your DNA. Um, so I've always said, we got the privacy question quite a bit, and I've always said that 23andMe has no business if we actually can't protect your privacy. So we do everything that we can to enable you to have the privacy that you want. So very early on, privacy experts came in and they said, look, privacy doesn't mean that you don't want anyone to get access to it. Privacy means that you want to have the choice to enable who you want to get access and, and prevent people from getting access who you do not want to get access. So 23andMe, for instance, like we let you share your DNA. So we enable you to share it, but we want to put it all in your control and we want it to be totally transparent about who is actually seeing your DNA. And you have to understand that you are shedding DNA all the time, cells, DNA, and uh, so I defy you to leave this room without leaving your DNA behind, number one. Number two, have you ever watched a single episode of Law and Order? <laughs> you don't take the Coke and drink it in the coffee cup and leave it on the counter and go, come on, guys, you don't throw it away with the guys following you down the street. Don't do this. You know, so it's like you're saying you're worried about the spit in there. It's like, look at it's. It's like we're not going to have identity cards in a very short period of time, relatively speaking, because this is your identity. You know, so it's uh, you can't separate yourself from it. Um, this is sort of interesting uh, to me because I think that now we get into. Um, I'm very numbers oriented. I'm you know I'm computer science and all, so I'm really oh I love all this stuff. And and yet show it to me on the screen. Show it to me. That's what I want to see. But I think this is a really important question. Does your company order uh, offer counseling to individuals mm -hmm. who to just to learn about this so they somebody to talk to? Uh, and what if you do have some mutated genes that might lead to something? What, uh, what so, so we felt like when we started the company, we felt like it was a conflict of interest for actually to have genetic counseling in-house as well as offering the test. So that if we were offering the test, we wanted to be able to offer the you know, unbiased results about this is, what it, this is what it is and this is what the literature is saying about it. And if you want to know what to do, you should take that to an independent genetic counselor or independent physician. So 23andMe does contract with one of the largest genetic counseling groups out there called Informed DNA, and people can call and have by a phone conversations about their genetic information. One of the things that we've also started to do is, as you probably realize, if you are diagnosed with something new or you have something, the first thing that you do is you go to the web and you read WebMD, you read you know, Mayo, or you know, all the different websites, or you look also at forums. So one of the things that 23andMe tried to foster, or we are fostering now, is discussions about what is it that people are doing with the information that they've learned. So we find that that's actually really helpful for individuals, is that they're newly diagnosed, they find something new, they're high risk for Parkinson's disease, they wanna know, they can go and they can read in all the message boards, and everyone in our message boards are people who are also genotyped. So they also have the genetic information, and they're also vested in the same way. How many genomes have you uh, collected to date with uh, 
uh, all the all the ge all the spit you've collected, and what are the top three things you've learned since gathering the data with respect to the genomes on the Susan? Yeah, um, we have over seven hundred thousand. Oh, sorry, uh, over six hundred fifty thousand individuals who have spat, um, growing growing pretty well. Um, I think that um, um, in terms of things that we have learned. Um, I mean, that's a great question. What is it that has actually really come Maybe they didn't tell you. You're so busy running the company. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think... Um, Call um, the scientists now. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a whole team right here. Um, I mean, I think that there's been all kinds... I mean, part of what's, what's fascinating... Th actually, I think one of actually the most interesting discoveries that we've had um, is, you know, when people originally said, like, oh, you're just going to recruit healthy individuals, um, one thing is that there's actually no, no such thing as a health completely healthy individual, that everyone has something. And it could be that everyone has something that's genetic or everyone has something that's, that's actually manifests as a disease or something mild like asthma or, or migraines, but everyone has something. And, um, and that actually leads to the fact that almost everyone has a story. Um, I think one of the other things that I think I've learned is that I really had the assumption at first that health was gonna be one of the most dominant aspects of that, you know, things that people want. And, and, it, and it is, health is really probably, um, is, is super important to individuals. But the way people change their life and their behavior based on ancestry stories is phenomenal. Um, and we have a couple individuals who found that they, you know, they were adopted and they found that they had relatives in a different area or that, you know, they're from, you know, a population. One person in particular who's from the Arctic, you know, a sort of uh, tribal group up in the Arctic. And she actually moved there. Um, to go be with them and how much that changes. So it's not just the health side that really changes behavior, but it's actually the sense of identity and how much people are looking for a sense of identity. Um, and some of the most common questions we get is, you know, people want to know, am I Jewish? And or Jewish and, um, and Native American. <laughs> I'm Irish. Maybe yeah. I am Jewish. <laughs> and I so <laughs> you and never know. And well, that's also <laughs> the thing is that you never know. Like I can make assumptions about you, but like you actually never really know. And one of the other surprises that always comes out is, is how much you know, non-paternity becomes an issue. And, and it's coming up all the time lately about how grandparents actually, like Uncle Joe or Great Uncle Joe is not actually, he's half Great Uncle Joe. Um, well, and so <laughs> yeah. Well, so you know, there was used to be before with the genetics at the National Institutes for Health. There's a big hospital there, and if you were uh, so unfortunate, but then fortunate to be diagnosed there, these are called undiagnosed diseases. They had no idea, and a major over 50 percent of them went away once they could do genetic tests mm -hmm. because they were inbreeding. Mm -hmm. And yeah. th that's a that's there is a reason not to. Yeah, they say second cousin. Okay, forget it after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're but they but they were they suddenly could say, oh no, here's what happened. You get missing programming in your genome with with, with inbreeding, and it's unfortunate because it's this major social yeah. thing. Now, what I'd like to do is like I was just going through this, and I, I sort of feel uh, that I think what's really important for people is to hear, if you would where you think your mission is going. You've talked about your mission before, how it might change over time. What's that future for you? I mean, we're asking you to be a little psychic here, yeah. but already, I think from start to now, it, it's begun to evolve. I actually think one of the things about 23andMe is our mission has not changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's very much to, to revolutionize healthcare. And I do believe that um, two big factors, I think that genetics will revolutionize healthcare and I think the, the trend, that consumerization of healthcare, like actually putting you in control of your information in your healthcare, I think is gonna change the whole system. And I think as an example, you look at things like YouTube and media, you know, t five, 10 years ago, I used to see media executives and they'd be like, over my dead body, will I ever put my content online? And, and you look at it today and how much it's changed. And it didn't change because they were such willing participants, it changed because the consumer created a competitive source through YouTube and other groups that actually required them that they had to compete there. And I think that's actually what's gonna change. I think a lot's gonna change in healthcare because the consumer is actually gonna start owning their information and taking control and they're gonna wanna make decisions. They're not gonna want a third party intermediary in their healthcare system. So I think those two things are going to truly revolutionize healthcare. Anne Wojcicki, 23andMe, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Let's eat. Not this way, this way. <laughs> Again, thank you very much. And uh, if you would like to exit here at the front of the theater,